Jim Cather shivered again, despite the thick brown warmth of his overcoat. He was standing on the frost-whitened platform of planking that permitted access to the lower gears of the huge, old, overshot water wheel. Water spurted thinly through holes in the rimmed metal buckets of the wheel. And below the wheel a constant soft splash of falling drops sounded from the dark waters of the mill race. The great shaft of the wheel, held securely by ungainly but well-babbited journals, ended in a gear that in turn meshed with a huge wooden cogged gear. And upon the teeth of the gears, there was a sticky red substance that shone wetly in the dusty light of the naked bulb overhead. He could have slipped and fallen across them. Admitted the owner of the grist mill, reluctantly, but after nine years at the same job, he frowned thoughtfully. Looked like he was trying to oil the machinery, said the lanky farmer whose grist waited upstairs on the mill floor. He shook his head. Poor Pauline, he said. She's going to take this hard. They was twins, you know. Jim Gather nodded absentmindedly. I'd forgot you married his sister, he said. Jeff Bryan was the best man I had, Arch, and I'd planned to give him a party this weekend. Too bad he didn't quit last week, said Arch Nelson sourly. This mill's a regular death trap. Gather choked back an angry retort. He leaned out over the small gear to peer more closely at the oil slot in the oversized journal. His eyes narrowed as he looked down below the shaft and the gear at the upset quart metal measure the dying man must have dropped there as the meshing gears caught his head and right arm. Carefully he extended his arm and with his finger stirred at the thin mixture of fresh greenish oil in the oil slot of the journal. When he turned around his forehead was deeply furrowed. He wiped the oil from his hand on an old scrap of belting. We're calling the sheriff, he said to the lanky farmer, and to broad-faced, slow-witted Milo Parker, who stood at the top of the dust-whitened steps on the main mill's level. Parker's face remained as impassive as before, but Arch Nelson turned a startled, reddish, stubbled face. Well, what do you mean? he demanded. Think maybe he was made way with Jim, killed on purpose. Afraid so, admitted Gather. Let's go up to the office. No use freezing down here. The office was a small barren room with a half dozen battered old chairs and board-topped nail kegs closing in around the rusty pot-bellied warmth of the stove. In one corner, behind the black wooden counter, perched Hilton Scott, the mill's manager, toying nervously with a well-chewed green pencil. Gather frowned as his foot bumped a sticky black oil measure beside the stove leg. Milo Parker opened the stove door and tossed half a bucket of corn cobs into the fire. Gold, he said, and grinned in a puzzled, half-hearted fashion. Think back, Milo, said Gather abruptly, to just before you turned up the gate to start the wheel. Did you hear anything? Nope, said the man, and now the normally ruddy color was oozing back into his putty-colored face. I hollered like I always do. Nobody answered, so I figured she was all clear. I raised the gate and the water hit the wheel. Then I see the red on the cogs of the big wheel and I stopped it. Only by that time, sneered Scott, his yellowed false teeth worrying the tobacco in his right cheek. Jeff was dead. Milo Parker's pale blue eyes squinted at his employer curiously. Maybe you're thinking I started up the wheel on purpose, he grumbled. I didn't. Had no reason to hate Jeff, but he had. Parker's head jerked in the general direction of the foreman. Scott jumped off his stool, swore, choked on his chew, and started toward the broad-faced man. Sit down, said Gather mildly, his brown eyes amused in a remote sort of way, and let's get to the bottom of this. Murder's a serious business, you know. He turned to face Parker. Spill it, he offered. Hilt's been short waiting some of the customers. Milo Parker's face darkened stubbornly. A few pounds here and a few more there. Been making mistakes on change, too. Jeff jumped him about it again yesterday. That's no reason for killing a man. Gather eyed his foreman thoughtfully. Parker's thick jaw quivered. Jeff threatened telling you. Said he was quitting Saturday anyhow. Had nothing to lose. You going to swallow that lie? Broke in Hilton Scott with an angry snort. His stained pink mustache bobbed like a wind-blown cork. Milo and Jeff was always squabbling. Had to part them a dozen times this last few months. 
Arch Nelson deliberately tamped coarse buckskin-colored tobacco into his old pipe. His long, narrow face lengthened. Jeff told my wife about him. And Milo, always wrangling, he said. But he carried the idea that usually it was just chewing matches. His narrow gaze swung to Hilton Scott. Jeff always said that Hilt was kind of close in his dealing. Maybe he was scraping off more cream than Jeff thought. I always checked over Hilt's figures before I paid him, he finished, holding the flame of a match over the blackened bowl. He puffed out a miniature blue cloud. Caught a lot of mistakes. The mill's manager snorted and turned to his employer. Before he paid, he gritted. Jeff had to lend him the money lots of times before I let him take a grist home. Arch is sore because I didn't give him the whole mill for nothing. I'm finding out a few things, said Cather wryly. Maybe I'd better spend the next few weeks here. The other three outfits can run themselves, I guess. His stubby, capable fingers nodded into fists. Always been proud of the Cather record for fair dealing, he went on, and I intend to keep it that way. Fine, applauded the lanky farmer, his pipe spouting quick bursts of smoke. I can tell you plenty things wrong. You've been losing plenty customers, Jim. If you used some of those ideas around home, growled Hilton Scott, maybe you wouldn't have lost your farm. Arch. He paused to shoot a jet of amber fluid at a sawdust-filled wooden bucket. I bet you run through the stock and tools your daddy-in-law left you in less than a year. Milo Parker closed his mouth abruptly. A car had pulled up outside the office door. He peered out through the window at the two overcoated men, both of them tall and clean-shaven, who were crossing the loading platform toward the office. Sheriff made a quick trip, he said. You didn't phone more than ten minutes ago, Jim. He went back to his nail keg seat. Got that reporter fellow, Herrick, with him, too. The door opened. Cather went to meet the lawman and his companion. Their voices were hushed. The reporter stamped the snow from his feet. Who do you think they'll arrest? Milo Parker asked. Neither of the other men answered. He frowned. Wonder why Jim is so sure Jeff was killed? Been wondering that myself, said Hilton Scott, as his jaws worked mechanically at the chewing tobacco in his cheek. Looked like an accident to me. Then the sheriff and Cather were with them. Cather's cold brown eyes raked them. Finally, his gaze halted at the red-stubbled face of the dead man's brother-in-law. An uneasy silence gripped the bare little office. There's your man, accused Cather calmly. He's the only possible suspect. Arch Nelson stepped backward into the hot iron belly of the stove. He screeched with the sudden pain, and his pipe jounced up from the floor, tobacco flying. He started as though to run, but the cold steel of the bracelets snapping about his wrists seemed to drain all the life from his lanky frame. The sheriff was puzzled. He had looked over the scene of the crime and checked it with the story that Arch Nelson had seemed so eager to babble out. The feel of those handcuffs about his bony wrists had broken down the farmer's resistance completely, but that did not explain how Cather had suspected him. Wasn't a lucky guess, was it, Jim? he inquired. I see how you figured he would have motive enough. Jeff wasn't married and Nelson's wife would be his heir. Nelson figured he'd get the farm Jeff inherited from his father, as well as the stock and tools that had been his wife's share of the estate. But knowing he had a motive didn't tell you that Nelson was the man who knocked Jeff Bryan unconscious and dropped his head across the gear he was oiling. Cather smiled thinly. He wasn't oiling the water wheel journal. Sheriff, he said. That was light oil in that quart measure Arch Nelson upset so carefully below the gears. And Nelson made his mistake when he filled the oil slot with that light oil. You see that quart measure of black oil beside the stove? That's 600W. Only place we use it is on the water wheel journals. In cold weather, it's like tar. Can't be poured without being heated. That's how I knew neither Milo Parker nor Hilton Scott were responsible for Jeff's death. They would never have used anything but a heavy oil. That left Nelson. 